everybody. This is the third time I've read these three chapters, which isn't your problem. It is only my problem. I'm just having an enormous amount of trouble uploading things. I wanted the camera on my computer is awful and I tried to use my phone with a new app and that didn't work and for some reason it's not working. I think it's because it ended up being three gig and I don't know how to make it smaller and it's all right. So take three of reading Boy Overboard by Morris Gleitzman. I'm reading from chapter 13 to page 60, on page 65. It's good because I've already had a bit of a practice um, and I know what to say and what to expect. Got to look at the bright side of things here. I was sitting in a really good spot. I had a tripod. It was looking really great. <sighs> chapter 13, page 65. We're out of the crowds now and almost back at the shop. It's taken a while because you keep bumping into things when you're running and crying at the same time. Will her be okay, sobs Bibi. She's been asking me the whole way, but I don't blame her. I've been asking myself the same thing. They'll be fine, I say to her. Dad rescued mum, you saw him. I don't say anything about government roadblocks and helicopters with telescopic sights. I just glance at the sky and feel sick with worry. We arrive back at the shop. Mum and dad aren't there. Bibi howls. I hug her and hug myself at the same time. This is good, I say to us both. If they got back first and found we weren't here, they'd be really worried. I wish it felt good. But why, are they, why aren't they here, wails Bibi. Dad probably wants to make sure he's not being followed, I say, desperately hoping I'm right. He's probably whizzing down one-way streets the wrong way, you know, like he's told us city taxi drivers do. I decide to pack our bags to be ready for a quick getaway when mum and dad do arrive. I go into the shop, then remember I packed everything before we went to the stadium. Everything except my ball, which I pack into my rucksack now. Oh, and mum's candlestick, which we left with a candle burning in it. The candle is still burning. I'm not going to pack that, not yet. Jamal! It's Bibby, screaming! I rush outside. A vehicle is speeding off the road in a blur of red and green. It ploughs across the open land and stops in a whirl of dust between the tape trees in the shop. Now I'm screaming too. We're both screaming their names as we run towards the taxi. Mum and Dad get out. We cling onto each other, all four, four of us, so hard it feels like my arms will snap. Then Dad pulls away. We've got to move fast, he says, going to the boot of the taxi. I'm not ready to move fast, but Mum pulls away. I thought they were going to kill you, sobs Bibby, clinging to Mum's dress. No, says Mum softly, stroking Bibby's head. Then Mum stares at Bibby as she realises we were in the stadium. She looks at me. I nod. No point in hiding it. Are they going to kill you because you're a teacher, says Bibby. Mum looks away. She nods. Her face is pale and dazed. Suddenly I can see she thought they were going to kill her too, and that makes me cry again. Mum turns and moves towards the shop. She stops. She stares at the candle burning in her candlestick. She turns back and puts her arms around me and Bibby again. Thank you, she whispers. Mum, says Bibby in a tiny voice, what will happen to those other women? Mum doesn't say anything for a long time. I look up and see the anguish on her face. My own chest hurts with the sadness of it. We couldn't do anything, I say softly to Bibi. We're just a family. Mum takes a deep breath. And we're going to stay a family, she says, keeping her arms round us. No matter where we go. She's never held me so tight. We're going on a trip, asks Bibi. Mum nods. Where? asks Bibi. A long way away, says Mum. Like a holiday, asks Bibi. Mum hesitates. Then she gives me and Bibi a brave smile. Sort of, she says. When are we going? asks Bibby. Very soon, says Dad from over by the taxi. I turn and see he's crouching by, by the driver's door with a can of paint. He's already painted half the green door red. He takes a lump of chewing gum out of his mouth and pushes it into a bullet hole and paints over it. Come on, Bibby, says Mum, let's get the things in the car. She goes into the shop. She's incredible. An hour ago, she was nearly shot and now she's organising Bibby. While Dad paints, I kneel next to him and catch the drips off the bottom of the door with my sleeve. The government will be on our trail soon and we don't want to leave tracks. 
clever thinking, Jamal, murmurs Dad. That makes me feel good. Dad, I say, what you did was so brave driving into that stadium and rescuing Mum. I wish you'd taken us. We could have helped you throw the smoke cans. Dad stops painting and stares at me. I remember he doesn't know I was in the stadium. I swallow. He puts a paint spattered hand on my shoulder. Jamal, he says quietly, you are a part of my heart and a part of my soul. I'm proud that you're my son. I put my arms around him so he can feel how I'm glowing inside. I'm proud that you're my dad, I say. We look at each other and suddenly I know that if dad can be a desert warrior in a soccer stadium, so can I. Then I remember we have to move fast. Shall I scratch the boot, I ask, and put some dints in the back doors to disguise it more? Dad blinks. He gives a flicker of a smile and shakes his head. Oh, this will be enough, he says. It's just to get us to the other side of the city. Then I'm going to sell the taxi to get money for our trip. I look at Dad in amazement. Sell the taxi? That must be really sad for him. He's had that taxi for years, longer than he's had me and Bibby. We must be fleeing to somewhere too far away to go in the taxi. Somewhere up some really steep hills. Taxi's never, never that good at hills. While Dad finishes the painting, I catch the drips and keep an eye out for government trucks and try not to think about the other women in the stadium. Mum sticks her head out of the shop. If you want to go to the toilet, says Mum, go now. None of us do. I'm too busy having thoughts about my new plan. If a person goes somewhere else and becomes a huge soccer star, I say to Eustace's grandfather in my imagination, and so does his sister and they play regularly on TV and then they go back to Afghanistan with their parents, do you think that'd be popular enough to help form a new government? A kind and fair government that wouldn't murder anyone? Yes, says Yusuf's grandfather. It's pretty, he's pretty old and wise, Yusuf's grandfather, even in my imagination, and he knows about these things. Okay, I say to him, I'll do it. Okay, so most important thing here is that if you remember, Jamal's solution to his problem was that he was going to become a soccer star and, and then, you know, they would be popular and the government wouldn't, wouldn't hurt him. He's now come to the realisation, holy crap, I have to make a new government that's fair and kind. And that's the only way to do it. Um, the candlestick, hey, wait, no, wait, the soccer ball and the candlestick turn up again in this. And the soccer ball is, again, remember, it's very, very symbolic and a very important thing. And he's, he's had it everywhere he's gone. It's very present and it turns up again in this chapter. But the candlestick, now I would never leave a candle burning if I wasn't in the house because I don't want to burn my house down. They left a candle burning. That's not why, they, this isn't Morris Gleitzman saying, oh, look at how irresponsible these children are. This, why is the candle, the candle burning? What does the candle mean? If the candle is burning in that lucky candlestick, then everything's going to be all right. And that's why the mum, that's why mum was just like, oh my God, I love you so much. There was a beautiful moment for, father and son moment in there as well where everyone's really proud of each other and I can tell you if my dad ever quietly said to me you are a part of my heart and a part of my soul I'm proud that you're my daughter or my son is which is what it said here I'd feel really awkward <laughs> it's, it's a sweet moment all right chapter 14 page 71 here we go, I'll keep going. Mum, groans Bibby, are we there yet? Mum doesn't reply for a while. In the darkness, I can feel her taking a deep breath and trying to stay calm. This is the millionth time Bibby has asked. No, dear, says Mum, be patient. It's hard being patient lying under here, lying here under these smelly old sacks in the back of this lurching, noisy, cold truck. I know it's a mountain road, but you'd think the driver could manage to avoid a few of the potholes especially as he's been paid all the money Dad got for the taxi. So Dad sold the taxi. They haven't really gone anywhere. They're now being smuggled somewhere in a truck going up a mountain. You can probably guess what happens next. Ow, says Bibby, my knees hurt. Here, says Mum, rustling in the dark. Have another lolly. I'm tempted to nag Mum and Dad myself. These sacks are really itchy. They smell like they've, they've had goats in them. And I wouldn't mind another lolly. But I don't say anything. Bibby needs the lollies more than me, and we all need to be under the sacks in the case a government patrol truck patrol stops the truck. I want to do a wee. 
Bibby, says Mum crossly, I told you to go before we left. You can't stop now, Flower, says Dad. You'll just have to wait. The truck hits a big hole. I wish it wouldn't do that. All this jolting is making my bladder feel full too. I have to get my mind off it. I decide to ask the question I've been too scared to ask. Dad, I say, where exactly are we going? I've wanted to ask since we left the city, but I've been worried about what the answer might be. I so much want it to be somewhere that has a famous soccer team like Barcelona or Brazil or Manchester. Dad isn't answering. Perhaps he's concentrating on his bladder muscles. I feel mum reach over and touch dad. I think we should tell them, she says. All right, says dad. He goes silent again. For a second, I wonder if he's forgotten where we're going, but he hasn't. When I hear his voice again, I realise he needed that bit of time to control his emotions. Mum and I have decided, he says, that we should all live as far away as we can from the government. We've decided to try and go to Australia. Australia? If my chin wasn't on the floor of the truck, my mouth would be falling open. If my chest wasn't on the floor too, my heart would be sinking even further than it is now. I'm not even sure where Australia is. If we did Australian geography at school, I must have been daydreaming about soccer at the time. I think it's a big place down the bottom of the globe somewhere. All I know for sure is that Australia hasn't got a team in the English Premier League. Now, I'm just going to stop there for just a sec. And for Dad, this is such a heartbreaking thing that they're leaving Afghanistan. They've They've, they're, his love for his country is the inference there. So you can infer that he, because he needed that little bit of time to control his emotions, that his emotions were sad emotions, that he's talking about leaving Afghanistan. So how does he feel about Afghanistan if he feels like crying at the thought of leaving it? It's kind of sad. Also, uh, so Jamal has no idea about Australia at all. No, zero. It's just like, what? Where's that? It's sort of this vague notion of where it might be on the map. Okay, carry on. Where's Australia, says Bibby. A long way away, says Dad, and, he, and in his voice I can hear how much he wishes we could stay at home. Australia is a wonderful place to start a new life, says Mum. Her weary voice is struggling not to sound sad, but it does. People in Australia are safe and happy and it's too far away for the government to find us. Suddenly the truck gives a huge lurch and starts to slow down. It stops. I can hear men's voices shouting. Lie still, whispers mum, not a sound. Luckily the truck engine is still rumbling and the sides of the truck is still rattling so the men outside can't hear the airstrikes going on inside my chest. Mum's hand feels its way to mine and squeezes gently. It helps. I hope she's doing the same for Bibby. Outside, the men are having a conversation with the driver. I can hear everything they're, they're saying, but money is, men, is mentioned. A, oh, sorry. I can't hear everything they're saying, but money is mentioned a fair bit. Nobody mentions opening the back of the truck and shooting the sacks, but some of them are probably thinking about it. I reach over with my hand and grip onto Dad's. We lie here, waiting, terrified. Then one of the men thumps the side of the truck. I pray they're not trying to break in. I pray it's just a signal to the driver. Suddenly, the truck jolts and moves off, the engine whining as the, as the driver changes gears. I start breathing again. Even though the air is freezing, our hands are all hot and sweaty. Dad holds on to mine for a long time. Bye, he says finally in a choking voice. At first, I think he's saying it to me. Then I realise we must have crossed the border and he's saying it to our country. Mum starts to sob quietly. Dad lets go of my hand to comfort her. I feel like crying too but instead I reach out and touch my rucksack. I want to check that my soccer ball is still packed safely. Just because I've never heard of Australia, any Australian soccer teams doesn't mean there aren't some good ones. I want to get all the practice I can on the way there, so I'm ready. The ball feels fine. My hand brushes against Mum's rucksack. I can feel the candlestick inside. Thanks, I whisper to Mum's ancestors. I won't let you down. Oh, my silly dogs. Goodness sake, sorry. My goodness. Okay, so 
in the bit where there's they're listening to where the you know there's men's voices that have come to the stop they're obviously at a border crossing and at the border crossing bribery is happening so so money is exchanging hands as these trucks go over i wonder how many trucks are passing through this border crossing every single day and how rich the border guards are becoming um it's interesting because because again soccer ball turns up again he's just like is it there yes it is yes it's fine it's it, it's it's all good ever present bloody soccer ball they are desperate to stay in their country they love their country so much and they are devastated that they have to leave it oh it's kind of heartbreaking but do they have to leave it yes mum was nearly executed are they just going to let her let him storm a stadium and steal her from an execution and not track them down and execute them no they have to leave there is no way that they can stay all right chapter 15. this is the biggest crowd i've ever seen including the european cup final on tv even the world cup final probably doesn't have as many people as this refugee camp or as much dust i've looked everywhere for a soccer pitch but there isn't one just tents thousands of them everywhere you look all over this scorching hot patch of desert there are tents made of old plastic or cardboard or twigs or cloths or cloth we haven't got any plastic or cardboard so we're using dad's coat for ours propped up on some sticks we can't all fit under it at once so we have to take turns mum and bibby are asleep in there at the moment which is good because it gets them out of the sun for a while can you imagine can you imagine camping on the ground in the elements with your entire family huddling under your dad's jacket propped up on a stick I can't oh. dad's off trying to find out how we can get to Australia I've been trying too. three days we've been here and I've asked loads of people and not one of them knows either that or they think I'm just playing around people don't take kids seriously sometimes even in refugee camps oh well at least I've got plenty of time to practice my ball skills foot knee head foot want to buy some water it's a boy with a gloomy face and a plastic bottle no thanks I say ever since we got to this camp people have been trying to sell us things water food old clothes or buy things from them there are pawnbrokers everywhere giving people money for their possessions so they can buy stuff they need luckily mum's good at packing so we didn't need to buy anything except the sticks for the tent only 50 cents american says the boy pushing the dusty bottle at me this isn't washing water it's it's drinking water the boy looks like he's been here for a while he might know how to get to australia apart from his scowl he looks kind of friendly want to play i say to him the boy nods not smiling i kick the ball to him he picks it up and runs off with it I can't believe it he's stealing my ball come back i yell i sprint after him it's not easy chasing someone in this place you've got to dodge trucks squeeze between tents jump over whole families and make sure you, you don't tread on any prayer mats or trip over any goats luckily i'm good at weaving between things better than the boy who sees i'm getting closer finally he drops the ball and keeps running i pick up the ball i'm tempted to try and catch that kid what he needs is a whack around the head and someone to explain to him about team spirit it's a pity yusuf isn't here but i don't because of what i see i'm in a different part of the camp now i haven't been in this part before the tents here are more worn and ragged the people are different too instead of cooking and talking and smoking and running off with each other's soccer balls like in our part of the camp these people are all lying down some of them are groaning they look sick this is terrible they need help what can i do mum's got a bit of medicine but it's mostly for headaches and upset tummies and it's nowhere near enough for all of these people i look around helplessly through the dust haze i'll do that again sorry i look around helplessly through the dust haze in the distance i see trucks moving slowly along the camp roads bringing more people in one of the trucks is different to the others it's white with a red cross on it i know a red crescent means doctors i hope a red cross does too i race over to the truck stop i yell and i get close the truck ignores me it keeps going i run after it overtake it and bang on its bonnet 
It still doesn't stop. I sprint in front of it and stand blocking its way. Now it'll either have to stop or run me over. It stops. The driver leans out and swears at me. Sick people, I say, loads of them, over there. Where, says the driver, I point. The driver glances over, then looks at me. Oh, they're not sick, he says. They're just hungry. We've been waiting a week for a food shipment. Oh, I say. Mum's got food too, bread mostly, but for all these people it would be only be a crumb it would only be a crumb each. The aid trucks are meant to be arriving any time, says the driver. You look like a concerned young man. Wanna help us hand out food? Yes, I say. Then I remember something. If I'm still here, I'm going to Australia. The driver looks impressed. Ha <laughs> ha, Australia, he says. He calls over his shoulder. Hey Gav, someone here you should meet. Now, just before we meet this person, um, what's interesting about all of this is that one section of the camp where people are sick and dying of hunger, they've run out of money, they've run out of things to sell, they've run out of stuff that they've brought, bought with them, brought with them because they've been in this camp for so long and not able to get out. That's the inference. And so they're waiting for for an aid shipment, who's responsible for bringing in bringing in aid to these people? Is it the government of the new country that they find themselves in, which I'm pretty sure is Pakistan? Is it the Pakistanis' uh, you know obligation to look after them and give them food, or is it charities, or what is it? And why is it late? What's going on? Why are these these are people who are starving to death in refugee camps and they can't get out? So Jamal is extremely naive. It's like, oh, I'm going to Australia in a couple of days. It's like, how is how how are you going to Australia if these people have been here for weeks, and they're trying to get out too, and they're starving to death in a refugee camp? How are you going to get out, Jamal? These are the questions that run through my mind. Anyway, who's this guy that he's about to meet? Hey, Gav, someone here you should meet. Another man appears from the back of the truck, sits down next to the driver, and looks at me. Going to Australia, says the driver, pointing to me. The other man grins. Best country in the world, Australia, he says. I stare back. I've never seen anybody with yellow hair, blue eyes and a red nose before, but his voice sounds sort of familiar, like those Australian strikers who play for Leeds United. This man's speaking my language, but I still recognise the accent. On the front of his t-shirt is a flag I don't recognise, the bit in one corner I've seen before, but the rest is blue with white stars. He must be Australian. I'm so excited I can hardly get the words out. Oh, what's it like in Australia, I ask him. Are there any good soccer teams? The, man, the Australian man laughs. Ha oh, ha, some great ones, he says. Where I come from, Dubbo Abattoirs United are world beaters. They've won the Western District Trophy for the last nine years. I gasp. Oh, that's wonderful. Are girls allowed to play soccer in Australia? I ask. Oh. <coughs> Hold on. God. Sorry, gave me a heart attack. Shush. Stop barking. Shush. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's wonderful. Are girls allowed to play soccer in Australia? I ask. Of course, he says, chuckling. Government wants them wants them to. Spends money encouraging them. I gasp again. That's even more wonderful. A kind and caring government. And are people allowed to be teachers and taxi drivers and bakers? I ask. The man grins. Definitely, he said. There's thousands of schools and thousands of taxis and millions of cake shops. I wish mum and dad and Bibi could hear this. So there's enough food for everyone in Australia, I say. Bucket, says the man. Supermarkets never close. Even better, if you've got a fishing line, you can catch your own tea. I'm not sure what this means, but tea out of a bucket sounds good. So people in Australia are happy, I say. Happy, says the man. They start laughing first thing in the morning and don't stop until two hours after they go to sleep at night. I can see it's true. The Australian man's been laughing right through our conversation. There's one more thing I need to know. Do, do you have any mines in Australia? I ask. My word we do, says the man. 
My heart sinks a bit. Lots of mines, says the man. Mines everywhere, full of gold, some of them. Gold? I stand in a daze as the Australian man gives me a wave and the truck moves away. Good old mum and dad. Trust them to choose the best country in the world. Even the landmines ha there have got gold in them so that if you get your legs blown off, you can afford the hospital bills in a wheelchair. I've got to tell mum and dad the good news. I start heading back in the direction I came from. Picking my way between the tents. But after a while, I'm not sure if it is the direction I came from. I try another direction and another. No sign of our tent. I ask people, but they haven't seen it either. Panic grabs my throat when I pass a three-legged goat I've seen before and, and realise I must be going round in circle. I start to run, frantic, bumping into people, treading on things. I run for ages till my chest hurts too much and I still haven't found our tent. Never give up, I say to myself, even when things are looking hopeless. But sometimes you don't know what else to do. I'm sitting here on my soccer ball in the hot dust, alone in the middle of thousands of people, wondering if I'll ever see Mum and Dad and Bibi again. What sort of desert warrior am I? I can't even find my way home. Sorry about the, inter about the interruption. I don't know what's going on outside, but my dogs are going off. Okay couple of things in this one of the great one of the lovely things in here um, is that his excitement at seeing at seeing talking about Australia one of the awful things about it is that Gav the Australian guy this blonde guy with blue eyes was taking the mick he was being a bit silly and he was exaggerating and he was sort of teasing Jamal which is kind of what our culture is kind of a little bit we do tend to be a bit sarcastic and we tend to be we do tend to tease people um, a bit and because it's kind of funny and that's exactly what was going on here with, between Gav and Jamal. Um, I love the bit where he's like, oh, tea out of a bucket, that sounds great because we, we call dinner tea but I don't think anywhere else in the world really calls dinner tea. I could be totally wrong about that but they certainly don't in, Af in Afghanistan. And also the misunderstanding about the mines. Gav's talking about like mines to dig stuff up out of the ground whereas Jamal is talking about destructive bombs that blow your legs off. It's kind of cute. It's such a it's such an interesting chapter because there's so it's so bleak and there's just no there's just not a lot of hope in this chapter and it's um and it's really quite it's really quite awful. Where does mum get a get the bread from? How do they have all the things that they need? It just makes me feel worried for them. Oh, okay. That's it for today. That's all we're going to be reading. So we read up to our next bit that we're going to be reading is going to be chapters 16, 17, 18. I think getting through three three chapters in a sitting is pretty good. Um, make sure you make sure you're taking notes as you go. Make sure you're thinking about the essay question you're going to be doing. Um, the quote in here. Oh my God! If I just read it. Never give up. I say to myself, even when things are looking hopeless. This is an example of perseverance that that Jamal has and is doing and all of that sort of stuff. So so here is the quote from question number two, if you're thinking about doing question number two, which is a good one, actually. All right, that's all. Have a lovely, lovely day. Um, thank you for watching and um, I'll see you soon.